Welcome to the third session of the fourth annual Creativity Spring Creativity Conference, sponsored by the Foundation for the Philosophy of Creativity and the American Institute of Philosophical and Cultural Thought. So we push on with Julian Klar, whose presentation is almost certain to be clear. <laughs> I hear that all of the time in my I, own language. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, when Germans uh, when Germans are saying "I understand you," they say "klar," "klar," <laughs> they say "great," right? yeah, <laughs> or they say "genau." So, uh, uh, so "genau," "klar." Uh, Julian is visiting us from the University of Heidelberg, where he's working on a PhD in political science, and has uh, has taken to the unhealthy. Uh, topic of pragmatism, and in particular the relationship between Dewey and Hannah Arendt, um, uh, and is here at the Dewey Archives, digging through what Dewey has to say that might be relevant to what Arendt has to say, and so uh, he has agreed uh, graciously to join us for the Creativity Conference and to pitch his uh, presentation in the direction of creativity, which I greatly appreciate his doing. So, Julian Klar, make him feel welcome. Now, thank you so much, Randy, for the moderation and introducing me. Actually, um, it's a very special occasion also for me because it's the very first time that I'm presenting my PhD research on a scientific conference to scientific peers. In the past, as a graduate student, I had actually also done presentations on papers and conferences done by students for other students. But this is now really for the peers directly. And actually, Before I'm also- Before you go any further, sorry. he means wissenschaftlich. These people are looking at you strangely because we do not use this word scientific to describe right. ourselves. Thank you. He means Wissenschaft. Is this yeah. all right? Yeah. <laughs> all right. right. So there might be some idiosyncrasies because English is not my mother tongue, but I'm quite happy if you just tell me when I'm making some mistake language wise or if you just uh, might overlook it. Now, I'm very thankful for the invite actually. Also when I came here February 11 I didn't even know that I might be invited um, to this conference actually. I just heard actually at the end of March of it and maybe even as one of the last persons so I'm the one who has got to thank you that I can be here today actually presenting to you. What I'm gonna present you why you are here today and what you want to learn is essentially a synopsis of my PhD project that's going to be on the political theories of Bun, done by Hannah Arendt and John Dewey and in a second step I argue that both of those great political thinkers also had theories of the political. I'm also going to um, expand a little further on where I see the difference between politics and the political to get you also clear on that. Now. I hope it's going to be illuminating for you, since you're going to learn a little more about Arendt and Huey, but also illuminating for me during the discussion, that I can understand your perspective on Huey, since I know that I'm really among the Huey experts here, as I'm also among friends, friends of Arendt and Huey and critical political thought, and I appreciate it very much. Now, my thesis to my thesis, so to speak, what I'm arguing really in favor of is that Arendt and Hewitt in many regards, not in all, but in many regards, would have been perfect allies to give us a thorough understanding of just what the political is, which is why I called my talk also siblings in spirit, question mark. And I believe that they were indeed siblings in spirit. Now, what I also believe is that um, the thoroughgoing analysis of their published works should also go hand in hand with source material. Why do I believe that? Now, published works, in a sense, shared by Arendt and Dewey as well, can be seen as rather inert. They do not move anymore. They do not speak to us, really. And in fact, both of them, Arendt and Huey, I would say would have agreed that political thinking, in fact, is a vivid and continuously going on life practice. And I want to actually grasp something of that. 
Now, I also want to back up and flank my own interpretation of Arndt's and Dewey's published works with the source material that I'm looking at currently now at the University of Carbondale. And I believe that Arendt and Huey would have said political thinking is always vital and therefore I want to reconstruct the thought process in its carrying out, in its performance and its consummation. And I would like to introduce now two paintings of Norman Rockwell to you. I have been told when I came to the US that Norman Rockwell was actually on the right-wing spectrum, right-wing Republican actually, I didn't know that. I wasn't even aware of that fact because we actually see back in Germany Rockwell as a great supporter of American democracy. Well, he can be a Republican at the same time, but I actually mentioned this because I'm just quoting his art, not that I would share his political views, just to make sure that you um, can fully appreciate that where I'm going with that. Now, the left one here is actually from 1948, we can tell, because these papers obviously depict Thomas Dewey, the Republican presidential candidate, and Truman, the Democratic presidential candidate of 1948, and is called the breakfast table political argument. And I guess it sums up quite nicely the question, is the private political? And on the right hand side, this is actually even much more famous. We see the famous one, Freedom of Speech of 1943. So still from during the wartime era and part of the Four Freedom series done by Rockwell. Now, in my opinion, it also could have been called blue collar versus white collar because we see those two classes here on the picture. But in my opinion, it epitomizes really, in a nutshell, Arendt's and Dewey's political thinking and their theories of the public space, in which we all can appear freely and egalitarian, because we do have here a blue-collar person amongst white-collar people. And I did also some research on the person that is being showed there. This was a lone descender named Jim Atcherton from actually also the Vermont neighborhood of Norman Rockwell because he always liked to depict some neighbors in his paintings. And what he really does is he appears, as Arendt would have dubbed it, in the public space. Dewey would have said we can utilize his social intelligence while this appearance and we can therefore use the creativity of the public via public discourse. And I also felt right welcome when I got here to the US and to special collections at SIUC because a poster version of this painting was on display on that particular week actually. I wanted to take a photo of it but then they hang it off unfortunately. Now the key questions to my talk that I would like to answer are actually what for Arndt and you the political is, how it works and what makes it essentially culturally distinct from other spheres of our human culture. And there I'm bringing in the metaphor, so to speak, of spheres of the political, because I believe there's only in some parts partial overlap between Arendt and Huey. They do not fully merge, they do sometimes not even mix very well, but there is partial only in some regards overlap between them. But I'm gonna explain to you what I mean by that. And in another step I will try to understand how they both conceived of the public sphere and how an integrated theory of the political is possible in their thinking and what also inter and transdisciplinary research can do for us in this regard. And also how a comparative political theory can be conducted in the sense successfully. So in a way I want to think beyond Arendt and Huey with their own means so to speak. I will give you first of all some definitions that I will recur to quite often and then give you the outline of the political theories of Arndt and Huey, what role also the public space played for these theories and then also give you an outline of a maybe integrated theory of the political before I will wrap up the message that I'm giving you today when I'm actually looking at also how my research can respond to questions of today's theory of democracy. Now, first of all, what is the political? This very ominous term that I used before. 
I'm following the definition by Walter, who said that the political is related to philosophy, investigating the essence of the object, so-called. And therefore, it moves on the ontological level. Politics, on the other hand, is a matter of empirics, asking for the processes concretely observable, and moves on the ontic level. We do already have this ontological ontic distinction in Kant, and we do have it in this ontological distinction, I mean here, also in Heidegger, which is why many of the researchers who are actually following this particular strain of thought are called the left Heideggerians. And I'm just quoting here the most important of them. Also, I would just like to mention other theories of the political that are being conducted today, especially followed by Judith Butler and Levinas and Derrida. But one also has to understand that this term, the political or das Politische, essentially came from Germany, from Karl Schmidt, der Begriff des Politischen. And you know that Karl Schmidt was not much of a Democrat. He actually thought that politics and the political was the never-ending struggle between friend and enemy, and that the enemy finally had to become eradicated. And we know what that led to. So, at the beginning of the 21st century, Chantal Mouffe, a Belgian political thinker, actually also posed the question, can we then actually still this, use this concept of the political? Although many other people, among the ones that I just mentioned here, also used the concept in the second half of the 20th century. Can we use this concept then still in the democratic discourse? And she said yes, because we can actually transform this antagonistic relation that we got between enemy and friend to an agonistic one between the opponent and our own party that we can still respect, so to speak, as the loyal opposition. We do not have menace against anyone, said Abraham Lincoln in his second inaugural speech back in 1865. Now, this tradition is very strong in the US despite what happened between 2017 and 2021. It also, it also is quite still vivid, I believe. And now the other point that I am raising with my talk is also what is essentially interdisciplinary research and what can it do for political theory? Anyone today talks about interdisciplinarity <laughs> but do people really understand what they're talking about? So I would like to give you a concise definition here. Now, first of all, the discipline sciences rely heavily on their own theories that are quite domesticated, their own methodology. Multidisciplinarity actually only enumerates what other researchers from other disciplines have found out, but essentially it's not interdisciplinary. Real interdisciplinarity tries to transcend the boundaries between certain parts of research and also give you a new paradigm that is integrated and that can also bring you new concepts and a new understanding of such concepts. As well as transdisciplinary that actually brings to fall down, so to speak, the boundaries between scholarly research and on the other hand the citizenship as a whole. And I'm not talking here about citizen science when, for example, astronomers are going through huge amounts of data with also citizens working for them without getting money for it. But I'm also talking here about, for example, social inequality and other political pressing issues and, of course, climate change. So problems like these are also called wicked problems because we cannot really define perfectly the boundaries where that particular problem actually begins, where it ends, and who the agents involved essentially are. That's why we call this problems actually wicked problems. And you want to really integrate also the citizenships into the deliberation process of politicians and scholars. You know that Dewey uses the term inter versus transactions. That, in my opinion, is rather a matter of speech that doesn't really bring us quite far in this regard. So I will not elaborate further on it here, but you also know about um, the quotation by Dewey where he talks in the quest for certainty and also in several other spaces of his work 
of the liaison officer or liaison officer that philosophy should be. So philosophy should be a translator between different pieces of scholarly research. And I would argue that that very well actually sums up what it is really about. But on the other hand, um, I cannot go really into detail with um, the quotations here because I don't want to bore you. You already know them. And as well, the problem is that my time also is limited and I got to really be economic with my time. Which brings me now to how, essentially, in my opinion, Arendt and Huey made use of trans and interdisciplinarity. You're acquainted with Arendt and her concept of totalitarianism. She would have argued that the sheer phenomenon of totalitarian terror, the Shoah, World War II, and the first part of the 20th century, silenced our traditional categories of political thought. They're up to no good anymore. We cannot grasp such horrendous phenomenons as the camps and the gulags with the categories of our traditional political thought. So we have to reconfigure our political thinking itself. We have to think politically to grasp the political. And she also did that by activating the narrative uh, strain, so to speak, of political thought, meaning novels, meaning drama, that she also looked at. She very much liked Brecht, and also the works by Benjamin, Walter Benjamin. So, she really tried to use those categories for political thinking, and, so to speak, to think without a banister, without a handrail that we could hold on. Because the abyss that actually the categories of our political thinking of the past vanished into are gone forever. They never will return and the abyss never will close again. So that is why we essentially knew a new paradigm that she brought it into a theory of totalitarianism and I would say that to a lesser degree we also see that in Huey and his idea of the inquiry process that's going on in all of society. So any human being does inquiry, even on a day-to-day -day basis, but we also do it in the whole society, so to speak. And I guess it's now a great time that I quote from a manuscript that I found actually from Thierry, from a lecture that he did back then at the University of Michigan when he was still young in 1892, only 33 years old. And it's quite striking what he says here, and I believe that's essentially interdisciplinary. I would like to quote now. We are a unifying people, the Americans that is. We can now attribute more to free play of consciousness than in any previous time. This reconstruction of political theory, and I would like to repeat right again, reconstruction of political theory, kind of what Arendt did later on, involves a unified adjustment to each other of three lines of thought, generally kept separated from each other. First, economics. Second, ethics. And third, politics. They, at any time, must take account of all the factors involved, if these factors are not seen to be common faces of a simple movement. They will be marked off into simple and separate regions, each having its own signs. And he goes on to say, it is ethical, and he means essentially the political as a social forming principle. It is ethical when we consider the whole or unity which is actually expressed in social life. It is economics if we are emphasizing the method or mechanism by which the end is kept moving in its realization. It is politics in the narrow sense if we consider the forms or institutions in which at any given time the end, working by the mechanism, expresses itself. So this is quite interdisciplinary, I would argue. And when it comes now to the question how I would define comparative political theory, I could be talking forever now, although Randy would actually throw me out and also Les Murray is still going to give a talk, so I'm not going to talk hours here about Hans-Georg Gadamer and classical hermeneutics. I also won't be discussing here Quentin Skinner and the classical historical reconstruction of political thought. 
But when you ask me, how can you do it? That you really make the comparison here between Arendt and Huey, and that you can uh, make them mutually understandable to each other. And how can you make their categories that they use in concepts mutually understandable to each other? I would follow essentially Blau, a paper of his from two, uh, 2016, that any interpretation in political theory consists of three parts. That is, an empirical, a philosophical, and adaptive interpretation. Now, the people on the internet cannot see it, but on my left side is sitting a piano with actually some uh, classic score music paper sitting on the piano. And I would say, to give you a metaphor, that essentially the empirical interpretation, what has the author really meant in the historical sense, and also the philosophical interpretation, how cogent, how cohesive are the arguments is, so to speak, classical music. There you really try to reconstruct what the people actually talked about, like 100% exactly. And in the second part, where I'm then looking at this integrated theory of the political, I'm, so to speak, doing an adaptive interpretation, where I actually take, so to speak, in jazz music in the way of essentially free interpretation, Arendt and Huey, and bring them in dialogue not only with each other, but also with our today's very exciting times, one must say. And I also agree here with Münkler and Strassenberger with their also very nice metaphor of the connection of creative archive maintenance and innovative laboratory. So, Dewey and Arendt in their own right are already classics, and that's good. But classics are not just like the archive that we can go into, but they also should be the laboratory where we can actually experiment with them. And of course, experimentation of democracy, that's so much Dewey but you already know that. And the question is now, I came up before here with the spheres of the political. I hope that also the people on the internet can see it now. Let one of those balls here be Arendt and the other one Dewey. And what such spheres can do is they can stay apart from each other. In some degrees, I said to you, in some strains of their political thinking, Arendt and Dewey are quite apart from each other. In some aspects, they touch. In other aspects, then, they intermingle, actually, they merge between 0 and 100%, or they become one, essentially. <laughs> now, and that is essentially what I try, how I try to approach really comparative political science. So what I'm doing is not a synthesis or an amalgam of Arendt and Huey, where they just become one and indistinguishable from each other, but an assemblage, as for example, Bruno Latour would have said. Now, that essentially also, um, one really should do when you, for example, look at um, this here from um, the Aaron papers. This, for example, I would like to quote to you is what Ernst Vollrath, maybe the only real student of Aaron back in Germany, wrote to her. And that's essentially what also I'm trying to grasp really in my interpretation. He says, and I'm translating this because this is German. What I admire most is your extraordinarily concrete way, and I'm not talking here in the sense of Hegel, of making phenomenons visible, of naming things by their names, and your judging of facts. While reading your works, it feels like these thoughts were coming alive in myself. Although I do not mean to say or to presume that I ever were capable of such a thing to do. And what I'm showing here to you are actually four chapters of the basic structure of my project. And you can here see that what I try to do in the Greek sense is dialegesthai, to actually have a conversation, a dialogue between Arendt and Huey, because when I'm, for example, looking at their understanding of the public space below here, first of all, I will ask Arendt, what do you mean by the public space and how do you know? Then I will do the same with Dewey and then I will bring them in the last part of each chapter here in conversation, direct conversation with each other actually. So when you actually make the comparison to America, America I would argue is not really a melting pot but it's a salad ball. And so to speak I will not pretend 
what I get from Arendt and Dewey was actually a melting pot, but really a salad bowl, so that the parts of their theories can actually be still distinguished and told apart from each other. But some of you might not be acquainted with Arendt as you are with John Dewey, which is why I would like to give you a quick zit wrap essentially about what the political thinking of Arendt and Dewey in each case was. So I would ask now Arendt and Dewey, both of them, what do you essentially mean with your political thought and how do you know in the first place? So, Frau Professor Arendt, what do you mean and how do you know? In my opinion, her theory can be broken down to three axes. Action, in its broadest sense, not only political action, can never be previsioned what's going to happen. It's never determined. So you have to be able to forgive one another to actually exculpate the mistakes of the past. And on the other hand, you have to be able to make promises for a common shared future. And that is essentially the idea she also had about that human beings have got the special faculty of making a new commencement in the world, so to speak, to create something entirely new that is not exclusively predetermined by natural causality. We do have free will. And on the other hand, that we can found political communities. Think of the founding fathers of America. And also she would have said that the public space is essentially made up of shared tenets of meaning. Der Sinn der Politik ist Freiheit. The meaning of politics is freedom. And that happens really in the public space and what she would have called the space of appearance, where essentially being and appearing, that's a little Heideggerian, are the same. They fall together. So it's a common world and we actually see that certain conspiracy ideologies always thrive when this shared common sense is very weak and when it's falling apart. Now, the basic condition really of her political theory in her sense is a plurality that makes them really up for two distinct spheres and the problem is that she would essentially essentialize the borderline, the boundary between those two spheres, which are the public and the private sphere. And what she also took from the scholastic tradition that Paniel also touched a little on in his talk, is this double trinity here of certain activities, vita activa and vita contemplativa of the scholastic tradition. So one could say essentially the appearing activities on my left and on the right side here the uh, thinking activities, whereas Arendt would have argued that only political action and public speech and on the other hand judgment are really political, whereas labor and work and it's also quite interesting here to note that in German she says for work herstellen, which would be better in English manufacturing, the manufacturing of an object world. Those activities and also the mind activities of willing and reasoning are not political because our connections to other human beings are being severed when we do that, at least in her um, theory. Now, what also is great about, I would say, her political theory is that she broke with the modern, early modern tradition that usually identified freedom and sovereignty. I would say, following Arendt, imagine for example Kim Jong-un of North Korea, that he is the only real sovereign person in his country, whereas the rest of the people in his country do not have political power at all. So she was one of the first persons that alerted us to the fact that we have to distinguish here between violence and power and also sovereignty and that they really do not coincide, they do not match. So really what democracies generate is power and what associations, and that's very Dewey, and associations create is political power. What the inert politics create, what the institutions create also in democracies to a lesser extent is violence. Moving on to Dewey, I found it a little harder to ascertain what essentially the most important aspects in Dewey are. But at least in my understanding, I also would like to break it down 
to essentially three axes. And I would say one of the most important preconditions to understand with Dewey is that, of course, democracy is not only a form of government for him, but it's also an everyday guiding principle, which is why I would argue that democracy for him is intrapolitical. It is one of the preconditions of the political, but they do not match entirely. So they are not entirely the same. And I would say that um, on the below line here, the great society, a term, by the way, that he borrowed from the book by Wallace of 1914, The Great Society, this particular great society, the way he saw it, especially in the public and its problems, is politically disintegrated and it's extremely socially unjust and it has to be reintegrated politically into a great community. But this conflict line he also took from Josiah Royce, with whom he was in some decent conflict about the question how this actually could be done. But I'll just have to leave it with this remark here so that you understand that also Royce talked about this in his work. Now, to understand what regular citizens like this guy of the painting that I showed you, freedom of speech, have got to contribute to the political process. We have to understand that we also have got to deal here with a democratic experimentalism in Tui, and on the other hand, also an evolutionism, that the political and any society evolve, which, of course, does not necessarily make him a Darwinian himself, although, of course, he was heavily influenced by him. And this is again the time that I would like to give you some quotations. Again, I'm saying I will not quote that much from his published works because you already know that, although I also do have such quotations with me, so that I could actually read that to you in the question and answer session, maybe. But I would like to quote here something that has to do with the fact that for him individualization and socialization are basically the two sides of the same coin. And in this manuscript of 1892, he says here something very intriguing, quote, individuality cannot be opposed to association. It is through association that man has acquired his individuality and it is through association that he exercises it. The theory which sets the individual over against society of necessity contradicts itself. And I also would like to talk now about here cooperation and communication in his thought, as well as how he defined freedom in this very early on um, expose, so to speak, of his thought, and also how his notion of the public evolved between back then and also um, the work of 1927, The Public and Its Problems, because we're going to see that it evolved quite considerably. I would like to quote again Dewey. Exactly the same principle is true in the social organism. Consciousness pertains to the individual in the social organism so far as he is not isolated in his activities but acts coordinately with other individuals whose respective activities are mutually inhibited and stimulated. And now something intriguing about freedom that reminds us very much of what Arendt said. The individual is free so far as his environment is in consciousness. So far as he is ignorant, that far is he a slave. It is the intelligence which the whole organism puts at the disposal of the individual which measures his freedom. The environment does not mean a physical surrounding, it means the conditions of action, kind of like in human condition. And what I also found quite intriguing as well is that he makes here a definition of, I quote, language as the communicating medium. And here comes the question now, does the medium itself by itself communicate? Or how is the relation and how can we put that then really into relation of what he said in other places? So this actually, um, I do not really know right now what to make of it, so I would like to leave that for the discussion of maybe. Now, one, one thing that I also would like to quote here is the very early definition that he gives of the public back also in this lecture. 
about essentially the differentiation between public and private. And you know, in the public and his problems, he says, well, anything is public that essentially affects a certain group of people. And that goes also beyond, for example, the family. Now, I quote, the activity would be private in so far as its immediate initiative would be in the hands of the individual himself. It would be public in being controlled by, derived from, and flowing from the general good, end quote, which sounds, at least for me, very much Rousseauian. So this is quite what we might actually see much more of Rousseau in the early Dewey than we see in later stages of his evolving, actually. And what I also found in the Arendt papers that struck me as quite interesting is actually what she had to say in a 1964 lecture on cybernetics. And I would just like to give you um, two very brief quotations of um, places that, that actually struck me from that when it comes about um, the human condition in the modern age. And I quote from this um, 1964 script here. The simple fact that man is not just conditioned by his environment, but that he conditions the environment and the environment then conditions him, that is this particular kind of what is now called feedback and which indeed is quite obvious in the whole history of the human race, wherever he finds it, that is, we are always much more speedily adjusted to new conditions then we think we could if you looked ahead of these. Once they are there, once the environment has reality changed, we are already conditioned even though we don't know it. And even though we may know very little about that actually conditioned us. Now, end quote. And what you do see here is also the term adjustment that Dewey also used a lot. So that strikes us first, and I would say this also sounds quite very much like the reflex art concept of Dewey. So if she would have essentially just taken that from him. And she leaves us also with a prediction for the future, so to speak, because um, the question that she poses at the end of the lecture is then... Mm, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I found it. Are we capable to devise the institutions of liberty in our political life which will fulfill the same function the polis fulfilled for the free citizens of Greece, namely, to spend their lives or a great deal of them in political activity or in public business? So how can we essentially revitalize politics and repolitize, so to speak, politics? and to essentially make sure that our daily institutions of political life resemble the political in its daily course? That is the question that she poses here. I would like to give you a quick digression on the question how the visions of people like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk also would change the political. Because what you see here are artistic um, projections of a so-called O'Neill cylinder. So that's supposed to be a space habitat where you can then have simulated gravity and essentially a simulated life world with, as you can see, waters, vegetation, flora, fauna, everything there, also human beings. And the question is, you know that Hannah Arendt made a distinction between human nature and the human condition. But if human nature should change in the future, if we should venture into space, like said two people, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, want us to do, to save the planet, to conserve the planet, and essentially move the gravest danger to the planet, which is us human beings away from the planet, if our human nature should change, will this then not also inevitably change the human condition and therefore the nature of the political? And I'm also giving you an example. I got here today with the help of my GPS, which I do have because of thousands of satellites up there, 
while we're seeing right now, so to speak, the third spatial evolution, the third evolution revolution of space after the colonization of the world by the Europeans and the globalization, we see that essentially the political again becomes self-reflective. We're looking back on our planet with those devices, with telescopes, satellites, and so on. So although we're still on the same space that we always used to be, it has changed significantly for us. We experience it entirely differently because of this technological um, progress essentially and when you do make some reading in the popular literature on that then I would like to um, just name the Expanse novels and also the novel 2312 that depict what could happen to the political in the future and what do really now Arendt and Dewey make of an integrated theory of the political what would that be for them I would say that the public, the democratic public, as the creative space of individual self-expression and of social toll, self-reflective inquiry is the most important precondition for it. So that essentially the political happens between people. She also said in one of her works, the human being is not political. What happens between human beings, that is the political, the happening, the interactions. And that's again Dewey, very much so. So I would say we experience the political in a certain tenet, in a certain fabric, is the, meta the metaphor that aren't used, of intersubjectively mediated references of signification. What I said, that the meaning of politics is freedom, and this meaning is essentially constructed by ourselves every day. And I would say, if you really want to give a definition here of democracy. I would really say it here with Abraham Lincoln that democracy also for Arndt and Huey would have been the government of, by and for the people. And on the other hand, that um, the totalitarianism therefore is really so to speak the negative that we have to be wary of. Because I would say, and that's very clear really for Arndt and Huey, that any part of government and institutions always is being deduced from the public and not the other way around. So the public and the institutions should not be enemies towards another, they should not be opposite to each other, but there should be a deduction going on from said institutions from the public sphere. Also resembling in the action concept of Hannah Arendt that she made the distinction of Greek, Pratein and Arcane the everyday action pratein and arcane to make a beginning, something that is entirely distinctive and new, a new beginning in the world. That's pratein for her. And that's what we do every day in the public sphere, in public speech and action. Whereas the dictatorship's aim always is silencing, the silencing of and the making disappear of the public space and of this genuinely base of appearance. And that's also why she essentially called totalitarianism's invention, so to speak, meaning the camps of the Nazis and the gulags of Stalin's communism, Soviet communism, the holes of oblivion, where essentially not only human beings are being killed, but their stories and what they went through and what they suffered lose any meaning mm. because it's being forgotten. It cannot be communicated to the world. And even if their inmates should survive, they're destroyed as political beings. And that is, that is essentially the horror of totalitarianism for her. And that we really have to wrap our heads around first what essentially totalitarianism meant for her. Not any form of dictatorship, but the destruction of plurality, the destruction of the human condition, and the destruction of the political at that. Now, I would actually like to gloss over this because I talked about it before. I would say that if you really want to summarize now Arendt and Huey, you could say that the political 
is being generated also by symbolic interaction. And I know what you're gonna say, symbolic interactionism that already is a thing. That used to be a school of, soci of sociology in the 20th century. But in my opinion, what I talked about here, and this so to speak is an in-between summary of what I talked about up until this point, I would say that this is essentially symbolic interaction, what Arendt and Dewey are talking here about. So if you wanted to give that a buzzword, then you really could say it's symbolic interactionism because it's public speech and political action. And of course, symbolic does here mean not in the sense of symbol politics, so politics that doesn't really mean anything, but it means here really mediated by symbols and that means in language and in writing. And what I would like to just name here for a sec is interestingly enough where Dewey on one place, and it's essentially the only place that I've found so far, talks about the political and gives a tiny definition of it. And he says here, turn now to political. And this is from a 1926 social philosophy um, lecture manuscript where he says, turn now to political recall along with legal the affair of structures that is limiting and relatively stable conditions which canalize action in certain channels and organize it into certain acceptable and repeated patterns that's what the political is for him and it goes hand in hand with the institutions and with the legal so that really for him is a unity and you know that our end was heavy heavily influenced by Greek, by Roman political thought, also by the Hebrew Christian tradition, and she also was heavily influenced by those guys. This is from Machiavelli, these are reading notes from Dewey on Machiavelli's The Prince, and this is the back cover from Emile by Rousseau, also part of the Dewey papers. And what I then also will do in the second part of my project is that I also will do the comparison of the influences of them too. But as far as I know, she didn't really read Whitehead because this here is also the back cover of Whitehead's Adventures of Ideas as well part of the Dewey papers. But it also gives you an understanding where Dewey took his ideas from. And you know that Arendt and Dewey were somehow weary of systematicism and the idea that you could do an integrated theory of the political that was systematized. And I understand that and I'm also quite weary about that. So many years ago I had read, um, I read this book here by Mark Johnston that's called Surviving Death. And he there takes the metaphor of the ancient Greek river god Proteus to underline his philosophical theory that essentially human personality is something very volatile that changes all of the time and personality is in fact interpersonal. It goes on between human beings and it's shape-shifting. It never stays the same. It's not fixed. And the same way I would say that for Arendt and Dewey such a theory of the political has also be to be protean in character that it's never fixed it always changes its form and not only between different societies and times but essentially everywhere every time and also any researcher will grasp the political differently think for example back um, and i guess that's part of the middle works part three of dewey the postulate of immediate empiricism any object is as what it is experienced as and anyone will certainly experience the political differently but if you want me to give you a kind of systematized um, theory i would actually come up with certain parts functions and achievements of such a theory that first of all to me had three parts. We have to understand the being of the political, how essentially it can be understood, that's a part of epistemology, and also how we can investigate it in the sense, or how we can, can we inquire it in the sense of methodology. And I would say that was kind of flawed. We also need an axiology, so an understanding of values in the political process. 
And in my opinion, this really is, so to speak, a map of the political, what it can be for Arendt and Tui, so to speak, for our two cartographers of the political. That's the metaphor I would like to use here. But I would like to just give you an outline before I wrap up my talk. And that is about the question that is today vividly discussed in theory of democracy. Should we essentially reinstall democracy by lot, as it has been done in many polis, in many Greek city-states back in the ancient times? Wouldn't that be just if any person could be selected by lot and therefore become part of the Senate or of the House, whatever? And you do have lots of scholarship discussing this question, and to me it was kind of striking that Arendt and Dewey, who very well knew the ancient tradition, in no place of their work essentially talk about certition and democracy by lot. I do have a preliminary answer, some thoughts to that question that crossed my mind, but I would like to actually leave that for later for the question and answer session, and I wanted to do that in the first place. I'm only talking about here quickly what you see here. This used to be an allotting machine with where they plotted the people on juries that also sent Socrates to death. These were then nameplates for the people selected by the lot. And on the upper right side, you can see here some clay fragments um, from an ostracism where essentially many popular politicians back in Athens were um, selected to go into exile for some time because they were considered to be demagogues and dangerous for the political system. And then they usually spent some months or years in a very luxurious villa and came back. So that is essentially how ostracism back then worked. For example, uh, and also English language got the word ostracism from that, although today it has got a different meaning. And to really now give you, so to speak, the roundup and recapitulation of the ideas that I presented to you and what I think that lies at the gist of the political in the perspective of Arendt and Huey. In my opinion, the political to them is the agonal uncovering of individual distinction within the public sphere. That means in the agon, Greek, the struggle, where we do not kill each other randomly, but we exchange arguments and not bullets. We go to bout, but we do not exchange bullets. On the other hand, I would say that both of them would have advocated participatory democracy with a strong epistemic impetus, that we have to pull the social intelligence of people. That's what episteme in ancient Greece was about, so to speak the science, but in this sense, I also mean by that the knowledge of people. Mm -hmm. Knowledge comes from the street, not from the ivory tower. And also deliberation should see, be seen as a process that changes and transforms citizens themselves. We're not staying the same persons when we're going into the public process and when we leave again. So I would say certainly that the political is constituted in this way and also we can actualize citizenship as a quality within the pluralism of our perspectives. And what is now, so to speak, the so what part, what is the added value of my project for research? I would say that our understanding of the political as an expression of cultural plurality and as a creative forming power of societies can explain to us why there has been a strong overemphasis or, on the other hand, a fading away of the political during the course of history. We did have a strong overemphasis for example, in the Second World War, doing Nazism, doing Stalinism, where the political in form of a totalitarian ideology tried to control any part of human life. And we do obviously see today a fading away of the political. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, understanding the political in its protean character allows us, so to speak, a tentative theory of itself that also remains open for a vision. And that also is quite due in to always see also any scientific endeavor as an ongoing process that has to be up for revision. And third, I would say that this way we can also unlock, so to speak, a new paradigm of thinking the political 
in a truly political way, so politically. And last but not least, I would say that Arendt and Huey would have agreed on an epistemic approach to democracy. And also what I'm doing as an individual researcher here is that, of course, I also have got to answer myself where my own categories come from. So that way, I and also the political are co-constituted. I'm the researcher, but on the other hand, I'm not looking at atoms or chemistry. I'm looking at a process of which I am myself, I'm a part of. And by then really looking at it and into it, I'm also changing it. And of course, such a theory is never exhaustive. I could go on and on now, but I guess this was really enough now from my part on Arendt and Huey, but I would like to leave you with just this simple map here that is essentially from the Democracy Index done by The Economist back in 2021. Now, all of the green countries are democracies to varying degrees, and all of the orange here and red ones are dictatorships. And this yellow stuff here is hybrid regimes, okay? And what we can see basically is that only 11.7% of the world population, so not many people, live in fully established democracies. And I would say this is really alarming that democracy always has been contested, that's nothing new. But it's now contested on a qualitatively entirely new level. And I would say, also really in agreement with Dewey, that in order to save democracy, to attain democratic ends, we have to use democratic means. It can only be done by that way. And I would say that democracy begins at home, not only domestically in the sense of in the US, but also really at home, how we care for other people and how we interact with other people. And I would say it's really an everyday choice that we face. And we do have this opportunity of making a good choice. And I would say, so let's take advantage of it and make something good of it. So thank you very much up until this point. And for the discussion, I got some questions for you, namely where you might see the problems of my project and where you believe that I have got, so to speak, the horse blinders that keep me from getting the right perspective, so to speak. But thank you so much for your attention. Questions in the chat? No, nope. uh, not yet. Not yet. Well, I have a question. Um, I have a lot of questions, mm -hmm. but uh, I'll limit it to just one. Um, when I first met Julian, I thought that the um, association of Arendt with Dewey was unusual, to say the least, because their temperaments are so different. Um, and I had read Origins of Totalitarianism, and I knew a lot about Arendt's history. And her distinction between the public and the private is almost the opposite of Dewey's understanding between the public and the private. But that's because Arendt has the history of a reversal of public and private that she understands as the sort of the onset of the modern. <clears throat> Dewey doesn't know anything about any of this stuff. He was interpreting the public as he saw it in his lifetime, and he didn't have this depth of historical understanding that Arendt had. And so for Arendt, the reversal of the public and the private had to do with the subversion of the originary Hebrew value um, of what we say in the public and how we're drawn out into the public sphere is exactly the opposite of our work lives and everything that we do in labor. Whereas for Dewey, because he was raised in a time when the awareness of labor as a politically important activity was becoming more and more the case. He saw labor as being public. However, mm -hmm. I have been convinced by Julian's argument that this is not crucial to understanding the relationship between them. It's what's crucial is this distinction between the political 
and politics between the, the idea of the political and what happens on the ground in politics that in fact Dewey and Arendt share this distinction. It's utterly unfair to both of them to put it on the Heideggerian frame of ontic and ontological because mm -hmm. both of them reject that distinction as being final. Uh, there's a sense in which public life enters into private life and private life enters into public life and that's exactly right, you're exactly right, Julian. That's, and so I really appreciate that. But, there's always a but, mm -hmm. isn't there? <laughs> you adopt something that I would call almost the prophetic mode as regards the future of the political, but you don't say anything about the future of politics. Mm -hmm. And that worries me. Because I can be optimistic about the future of the political, as you use the term, but I want to know about the future of politics. So there's an election in France, for example, but how is it that politics in the present as we all experience it roiling around, is, is related to this important realm of the political as you depict it in your theory, which is just beautiful. I don't know whether it's true, but it's certainly beautiful. <laughs> what do you think? Okay. Um, in the typically Dewey and Arendtian way, I would actually like to go with um, the audience joker, if there is one, <laughs> and um, ask the people how you would actually conceive of this relationship. But what I can say so prelim preliminary, I'm sorry it's a difficult word, preliminary. So what I can really say from the perspective now. Now Arendt and Dewey and both of them were, I would say, weary of social sciences as in its quantitative form, especially Arendt. And she, of course, would have said the question is put in the wrong way. Of course, you can make a prediction of how the presidential election in France now between Le Pen and Macron is um, going to go out, actually. Who of them will win? And maybe we actually now know results because of the time difference to Europe. At least I haven't checked. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know yet, but it's, but it's important, isn't it? But it's, it's a way of understanding politics in a mechanical way. So you have to essentially understand politics and the political in different ways. These are different ways of understanding for her. That's essentially what I would say on the RN part. And when it comes now really to Dewey, then I would say, at least in my understanding of what the politics I'm sorry, politics in the future might become or what it might degrade even worse than it essentially did in his opinion. I would argue that um, he would have been quite on a par with Arendt on this regard. And that essentially when he talks about that we have to transform the great society into a great community and also have to have face-to-face -face democracy in the town hall back again where he says then democracy always have to, has to begin at home and on the local sphere. I would say that he's really talking about retransforming politics and reinvigorating it with the political. That's how I would answer to that. So the theory should intelligize the practice? Is that what you're saying? That we should become theoretically more sophisticated and therefore our practice would improve? Is that what you're saying? Mm, I'm afraid now also um, the answer I could give is entirely wrong <laughs> because um, usually many people see Dewey as um, a catch-up modernist so everything would be fine if we would just have more modernization if not only economics would be modernized but also our living together I do not see that anymore because I also 
seen now actually more of our end and her criticism of her weariness essentially of the social sciences <coughs> as well and that he would um, actually not even bother coming up with such a question because of course it can have got a good value but he certainly was not a technocrat um, not a technocrat and how you're actually asking me the question is in a technocratic way if I may say so I didn't intend it to be. Um, uh, what okay. my intent was is not technocratic, but mm -hmm. um, politics versus the political. Mm -hmm. This is your essential distinction. And what you're saying is that Dewey and Arendt come together on the political, but with regard to politics, mm -hmm. you seem to be dismissive of politics. You're interested in the political. The politics doesn't seem to me to be important to you in a way that I would think it might be to a lot of people listening, even if you're right about Dewey and Arendt, even if you're right that that's where they connect, maybe they're out of touch. Mm -hmm. And yet, there's a prophetic stance that you're taking on the political without taking a prophetic stance on the politics. Okay, um, essentially it's the first time that I'm hearing about uh, taking a prophetic sense in political theory, but um, just to say for example for Dewey, I would say that he had the strongly experimentalist view on democracy and I would say that certainly politics can um, be more intelligent in his opinion, mm -hmm. that it's really an essentially ever ongoing inquiry process that really not is going on just in your and in my head but between us and anyone else on the street and that it simply can become better but it does not have to in the sense of a um, like self-fulfilling prophecy mm. but I would say that also he certainly talks about how the I'm sorry not the political but politics can become more intelligent and that means more informed by really the knowledge of the people. Whereas in Arendt, I am quite not certain whether she also would have subscribed to a notion of that in the politics sphere. You don't think so because you're... No, well, she's not. She's very pessimistic in a way mm -hmm. that Dewey is optimistic. Mm -hmm. You remember that when you first told me what you were working on, my, the first thing I did was shake my head. Mm -hmm. But it, you've convinced me that at the level of the political, as mm -hmm. you understand it, mm -hmm. there is a very significant and important overlap. You've convinced me of that. But when it comes to politics, I just have to say, okay, but isn't that where all the action is anyway? Mm -hmm. um, because the political responds to politics, not the other way around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We end up theorizing about what we're already doing, and I'm not really happy mm -hmm. about that, but that's the way it goes. I'm writing a paper right now on why Alexander Dugan is wrong. Mm -hmm. I would never write that paper if not for the war in Ukraine. And mm -hmm. so the political is responding to politics because it's on the ground. Mm -hmm. That's what's real. Okay, um, first of all, I do not, I would not agree with you that this relationship is just on one side. Mm -hmm. I would say that it can actually go um, both sides, but also um, when it comes now to the rather optimistic vision in Dewey and the rather pessimistic on politics that is, the vision on politics that Arendt and Dewey are having, well, they might disagree, but that's also what I want to say with my project with this metaphor spheres of the political, that they can disagree in some respects, whereas being on the same page in others. And I guess if I'm really explaining why they do have those different stances, then that's just fine, because when I'm making the comparison, then I will definitely work out agreement, but also disagreement. So um, I would say... A very theoretical answer, thank you. 
I don't know whether that's... Um, that wasn't really my question. <laughs> I guess it wasn't um, a compliment, neither, when you said it was a very theoretical question, um, answer to your question. Well, so, you're saying that in time you could work out the relationship between Arendt and Dewey, and that's not really what I'm asking about. I'm asking about the future politics and whether what you're saying is relevant to it or not. Hmm. I'm sorry. That's unfair, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's okay that you challenge me. Um, I mean, I can make it relevant. <laughs> Please do! <laughs> okay, but... Um, in three minutes. <laughs> maybe in three minutes, because that is one thing, and you have to forgive me, but I would have to think about a lot longer on that. Because um, it is a tough question, and that's what essentially I meant with um, the audience joker. Because at some game show where, where you can win lots of money, then you can also refer the question back to the audience and <laughs> having they answering the questions for you. But maybe we can really um, talk that over later. Other on. questions. All right, Julian okay. will be here for another month. Other questions. One Don't month. Shook has a question. Shook has a question. Oh, that's good to know. Hi, Julian. How are you doing today? Oh, it's lovely to see the crowd there. Look at everybody. All right. Hey, how are you? So I have a question for you about the role of publics. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't hear about publics or much at all of Dewey's theory and public and its problems. So I'm enjoying this distinction between the political and politics, the way I would think of it is it's kind of like Dewey's distinction between religion and the religious. The most important thing for Dewey, it seems to me, is the kind of grassroots political energies where citizens themselves can intelligently uh, get informed about the various sorts of dominations and powers, as Santiana once put it, the various sorts of exploitations and externalities from obviously ongoing association. It's what society is made of. So at any given moment of time, there are going to be innumerable uh, dominations and exploitations and shenanigans going on. So publics have to find themselves. They have to find joint concerns where they believe they are being exploited, dominated, uh, left out of various sorts of opportunities. And then those publics enter the political uh, sphere of politics and have their grievances aired, debated, and the experimental phase of inquiry can begin. How can we um, reduce, ameliorate these various dominations, exploitations, and harms, and so forth? Uh, while, while st still keeping, obviously, the good stuff going. Not exactly a harmonization, but some sort of mutual readjustment to ameliorate sort of the worst of whatever's been going on. Now, I, I view Dewey as a profoundly conservative thinker. I, I, don't, I don't view him as a big advocate of liberalism fundamentally for two, for two reasons. Number one, the burden of improving the social and economic cultural conditions of the people is not on government. It's not on intellectuals. It's on the people suffering from those problems. That is to say, the state should stay out of it until publics uh, air their complaints, may make some sort of intelligent uh, you know, statement of why they think what is going on. And uh, you know, the proposal uh, phase of hypothesis begins, then the state gets interested. The state is not proactive in Dewey. Dewey is not a progressive in that sense. The state is not proactive about making sure society is fabulous in 20 or 40 years. Can't be done. Why? Because Dewey again has a second very conservative view. He thinks that human beings individually and in association will constantly, perpetually be unable to help themselves, but engage in 
tacit or open exploitations, dominations, cruelties, uh, do, do terrible things to each other and then convince themselves that it wasn't their intention or it's not their problem. In other words, there's, a, there's an old saying that politics is the art of convincing the people that things that are deeply affecting them are really none of their business. Um, and, and that, of course, you know, that's a huge problem for Dewey. So, so then, after admitting those two conservative fundamental principles, which are actually in Hegel, then Dewey becomes a liberal. He says, well, now what sort of anticipatory and uh, preventative measures can we put in place, like civil rights and civil liberties, education, and so forth, so that you know, publics can at least find themselves and try to then find majorities, and majorities will care. But Dewey does not assume that majorities care about minorities. He does not make that assumption. He's why? Because he's not a romantic. <laughs> He's a stone cold Hegelian realist. Majorities by definition are settled majorities because they're enjoying the fruits of their domination and exploitation. That's why they stick together. They don't stick together out of, you know, thinking they're benefiting all of society or all of humanity. That, that's ideology. That's the feel good rationalization that the majorities tell themselves that, oh, the minorities would be much better off, uh, uh, would be much worse off if they didn't have our majority exploitation and domination and running things. So at any rate, um, uh, I, I, I hear these things in Arendt too. She is profoundly cynical and pessimistic for reasons we needn't go into about majorities. Uh, so what do we would expect, and I think this is where I'm going to get to my question. Do you, do you think that um, politics in uh, the democratic grassroots sense really runs off the rails um, when, of course, dominant majorities just manage to stay dominant majorities? Then sort of the whole politics sort of frees up, freezes up the dominant majorities not only expect to stay in power, they feel they deserve to stay in power. Uh, exploited subgroups can't get any of their proposals even aired or passed. They're told, shut up, sit down. You don't know what's going on. You're not entitled to run this country. And then politics becomes evil. Dewey doesn't throw around the word evil, but I think that's what Dewey would mean by political evil. That is to say, entrench and entrenched majorities uh, are allowed to continue on with their dominations and exploitations, uh, you know, for, for generations. And then politics gets ugly because then there's going to be, of course, war of one form or another. It's rather inevitable. At any rate, just a few thoughts on what Dewey might be up to in the public and its problems and why you don't, don't classify Dewey as a liberal unless you put it in the right place. I think in other respects, he's also fairly conservative. Thank you so much for this um, very illuminating question indeed. Um, although I would say how you framed Dewey here, um, how you framed him, not that you are one, but the way you framed him sounded actually more libertarian than conservative, I would say. That the state is not proactive and that essentially people should um, take care of their own stuff themselves. Now, I would object what you said in the beginning that essentially the publics make politics and then they mm -hmm. and then they enter the political. I would say I would say that um, it actually reverses the causality if you're willing to if you're willing to what? You can't get a response. Sorry, I got muted. Uh, I, I did not recommend libertarianism, and I am not saying Dewey yes. was a libertarian. Yes, of course. At all. That's the opposite of what I meant. I don't, You're right. I'm not saying that the state is supposed to. Have, I'm just saying, as a matter of actual fact, it does, and Dewey acknowledges that. He hates it, but he, you know, that. so let me clarify that. that this was no endorsement of libertarianism at all, quite the opposite. 
I also didn't understand it um, that way. Um, actually, it was rather intended as a joke. Um, but, oh, okay. <laughs> but yeah, but um, I mean, that's German uh, humor for you. You, first of all, have, have got to um, get used to it. Now, but what I wanted to object is how you described um, how the publics essentially interact. And I would say there is not like a mega public that encompasses all of the publics um, in UE. I would, I would not see that. So um, the way what I would really um, object against is what you said, that those publics essentially make politics and then they enter, you said, the political. And I would really say the political comes before it. It is essentially a forming principle of society. Okay, you didn't say that, but um, maybe it clarifies what I mean. And about um, the question that you essentially posed about majority rule. And that Arendt was quite um, distrusting majority rule. She certainly was because of her um, own experience with uh, totalitarianism back in Nazi Germany. And now the problem with majority rule, how it can be tamed with all. I would say that um, that's a very good question. I would say it cannot be done forever because as you pointed out correctly, the mindset of the majority, right? Okay, because I'm reading it just in the chat. Now, the problem is, can a majority that believes it has got the right, like for itself, to solve problems, be educated to um, also more idealistically respect uh, minority uh, opinions. I would say that only can be done, and that's maybe a paradox, with strong political institutions. Because you do have got to have minority rights. <laughs> and therefore, you always have to go also with the legal sphere. And that's a quotation from this particular 19. 26 lecture from Dewey that I brought, where he also said you do have the political at the same time with the legal, and you have to have certain, I'm going to answer that in a sec, whether I believe that education is a political institution. You have to have, of course, minority rights and strong institutions that can guarantee them. And maybe we can actually save the question about um, what John just posted here for later on. Maybe there are some questions here in the audience directly in Murfreesboro as well, or different people also in the Zoom area who have got questions. Any questions here? I wasn't satisfied with your answer to John's question. Someone who came up. Mm -hmm. Lucia Rafaela. To discipline and coordination. So who's that? Sabrina, do you have uh, Lucia Rafaela Wernick. Studying the importance of the interdisciplinary collaboration in an academic yeah. community. You um, certainly academic also academic can academic ask academic me via email. Research. Yes. So, what could I? Ask, uh, literally, it says what I ask you, email Julian. But I'm not sure no. Yeah, that. right. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. But um, if it would take too long. But um, then maybe I would like to go ahead and, by the way, try um, the camera is where I have to look at now. So not the camera of my laptop, sure. but this camera. Okay. Now, about the question whether essentially education was a political institution. It is de facto, because you do have essentially the obligation for students, young people, or kids, to have got some education and the state regulated it. But on the other hand, education, I would say, is a part of daily life. That's also something rather pre-political. And if you like, because I used the term before, I would say this is infrapolitical. And it certainly can be 
politicized, but that is what I would say Arendt rightly objected in her much debated essay on Little Rock, like back the epoch, end of the 50s, beginning of the 60s, where um, they came up with integrated schools, so that essentially the segregation between white and black at school should be abolished, and where uh, students then essentially had to be escorted into the school buildings. And she made the argument that kids should not be drawn into, at least not just yet, the political sphere. So it's often misrepresented what she meant, but essentially she said um, about this question whether education is a political institution. It is if we let it be. But on the other hand, I would argue it's infrapolitical. What does that mean? Excuse me? Intrapolitical, what is that? Infra, infra, infra? that it comes Below? before. What does it mean? Well, it comes before the politicum. And I mean, um, essentially, people, young kids, are not in many regards on the same level as our adults. And I would say that in the political sphere, they would not have the same possibilities to articulate themselves. So we have to educate themselves to give them the possibilities to engage in the political space. And that's why I would say this is a precondition of an egalitarian political space. And that also because of verse education that you might have than other people, you should not be disadvantaged in the political discourse. So, should there be no Fox News? That's a question about censorship. Well, but the thing is, is that kids are watching this stuff before they're in a position to make critical judgments. Mm -hmm. And so they bring to the table that you're imagining um, a whole host of Predispositions, is that a fair word for it? Let's not say they are judgments yet because they're too young. Predispositions that have to be dislodged in order to educate them. And so not only what their parents say, but you know, what Tucker Carlson says, or on the other side, you know, what give me the Tucker Carlson of the left, Keith, Keith Olbermann says, um, <clears throat> they come into your classroom and they've already heard this stuff. And they think it's true because they haven't heard the other side. Or maybe they have heard the other side, but they were mm -hmm. taught that it mm -hmm. was categorically false. This is politics. It's not the political. They don't even know what the political is. You would have to teach them that. Hmm. Right? Okay. No, I mean, that's really the old question, then can you teach virtue? Oh, really? Is that what it is? No, I'm not saying that the political is I virtue. Think, I think you made a leap there. Um, no. Nobody claimed this was teaching virtue. Ah, no, I get it. I see. It took me a minute. But I see it. Because what you're saying is that the people who teach these kids that Tucker Carlson is right and that whoever opposes him is wrong are sophists who are presuming to teach virtue. And the same thing would be true if they teach them if Keith Olbermann is right and everybody else is wrong. These are sophists. Well, the problem is I don't know neither of them, too. So. Oh, well, the ones on the right and the ones on the left. That's all you need to know. You don't know. It's not important who these people actually are. The point is, is mm -hmm. that they are extreme ideologues mm -hmm. of the left and right. Mm -hmm. That's all you need to know. You don't need to know who they actually are. Okay. Um. So, so you're saying that's that anybody who sends their kid to your school, and they're in your class, and you have to teach them 
the political. The trouble is, is that their politics is skewed to one direction or another. Mm -hmm. And your job is to teach them the political because you are a follower of Dewey and Arendt. Maybe we can actually go a little deeper in that later on, but I would maybe just wrap it up. The <laughs> thing that you made, um, the discourse that you came up with here, um, the question of education and politics or the political on the other hand. I would say you cannot escape that dilemma when you're actually conceiving of education as part of politics. And if you really would say it essentially were a political institution. So as I'm saying, and as I had said before, I would essentially agree more with Arendt that um, kids, even if they know it from home, from Fox News, and they're really um, ideologized, so to speak, or then of the left wing ponder of the person that you named from Fox News. Well, um, that is essentially a hard cookie to crack. Um, <laughs> I do not have a satisfying ready-made answer right now, but it certainly touches the point, and this is also why I'm giving a chapter in my thesis then also on the question of education and how it essentially um, relates to the political and politics, but that still is not done. And I hope that I can actually take the impulses from you and from John Shook and um, learn something more about that. But I just saw two hands. Yeah, here Pamela also and Michael both have questions. And hopefully that's something different now yeah, than education. Yeah, yeah hopefully politics. something different. Politics. Pamela, go ahead. Sorry, just a finger on this. Uh, on this. Um, I find very interesting the distinction between political and politics, like you said. Yeah. It seems a bit, I don't know, I, it kind of gives me a little bit of, of sense of, um, seems like a little bit like a roundabout um, to avoid some kind of uh, confrontations that might be lurking there. But, however, I do think that Dewey defends, you know, like I do remember this famous quote of Dewey. I think it's my, it's in uh, Democracy and Education, uh, if I don't remember, if I remember correctly. Um, so there's the, that education is not preparation for democracy, it's democracy itself. It's not preparation for the democratic life, it's already the democratic life itself. Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of seems as though the, mo the democratic life is a precondition of both politics and and uh, and uh, what's the other one? The political, right? Mm -hmm. It kind of uh, it kind of seems that um, there's, a, there's a way of being. It's a it's a manner of conducting yourself in the world, and by conducting yourself in this kind of open manner and putting to share the like like John Shook says. Uh, your your uh, your kind of um, your abilities in the in the hands of the community. You kind mm -hmm. of help sorting out uh, different challenges that the community might have. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so so I do find a little bit. I mean, I would. Sorry. What I want to say is that I do feel like you are on something very important. I think maybe. Maybe as opposed to Arendt, I know Arendt very little, I have to say, but as opposed to Arendt, maybe John Dewey has something more substantive to say about democracy that it, that kind of builds up to a better theory of politics and mm -hmm. the political in general. Because democracy seems to be something, uh, just like you say, infra-political, but in the way of, of a grounding for the political. Mm -hmm. Well, just the He's writing things down. Can I just um, maybe some, um, collect some things that yeah. you said, and then yeah. also Micah, and maybe I can sure, answer sure, sure, that sure. to that. In well, Absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah. What's your question? Yeah. Yeah. First, thank you. You're doing great. Yeah. 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 Up, I and I appreciate you going over it. Mm -hmm. I was very intrigued by the 
I think it was in Arendt's theory of politics. Uh -huh. um, this idea of forgiveness and promising, I think, almost being like constitutive of her view, her theory of politics. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm very interested, well, I've studied Schmidt's theory of the political, um, and the distinction between friends and enemies, which it sounds like you want to keep in your theory, but instead of it being theory of the political, instead of it being antagonistic, mm -hmm. it's just agonistic. And the question I have is this. One, I don't know anything about Arendt's view on forgiveness and promising, so I was hoping you could speak a little to that. Um, and do you see any constitutive role of emotions in your theory of the political? Because I think Schmidt hinges mm -hmm. on a kind of hate, ultimately. It's mm -hmm. that you love your friends and hate your enemies. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm curious, I'm right, that's why you have license to eliminate, and that's kind of the logical conclusion. But do you see a kind of counter emotion that would be constitutive of an alternative theory of the political? Okay. Cool. Maybe I'd like to answer your question before I answer the one from Paniel, because um, the one from Paniel still had to do more with, with education. And I would not say that there is one definite emotion in Arendt, maybe hope, if you actually could that bring in um, conjunction with her positive view of the future and the foundation thought actually, but I would say that um, whereas Dewey's deliberative theory is much more rationalistic, I would say it has got a certain, certainly stronger affectional, emotional dimension to it in Arendt, and I would say she took it from Aristotle and his uh, Techne Rhetorique, the book that he wrote on rhetorics and where he made the figure of the enthymema, which is essentially a syllogism that aims at the heart. Mm -hmm. That's essentially the um, translation of it from the ancient Greek. And I would say that um, this rationalistic narrowing down of the liberation theory in Dewey is not as strong as in Arendt. So I definitely would say that it's much stronger than that. And I would say that this particular enemy-friend distinction that Schmidt uh, certainly had is a tamed one in Arendt, if I'm correct, of course, with the distinction between politics and the political. Because if that doesn't exist, then the question isn't just relevant. But if it exists, then I would say it's really tamed in the agonistic way of the move that I cited so that the enemy only becomes an opponent that we respect. And to Panier, what you said, um, is then democracy education, essentially? As I tried to say in my talk, it builds the character, it helps us essentially elucidate the public, and also our arguments in the public are being elucidated, how? By epistemic democracy. Mm -hmm. And now, in my opinion, I still am quite not settled on the question what to make really of um, the challenges that I am facing currently with um, the question, is then education only nothing more than a political institution? But that I would essentially leave as a cliffhanger for certainly also future debates. But um, the preliminary answers that I've given so far are hopefully a little illuminating to you, but certainly on the educational question we could keep talking on much longer, which we could do in the future, but I'm afraid not now actually. All right. So thank, thank you, Julian, for an enlightening and excellent. Thanks for you all. <laughs>